In politics, one of the worst and most public humiliations in recent memory was that meted out to top Hillary Clinton aide Huma Abedin by her former husband, Congressman Anthony Weiner. Weiner ended up in prison after repeated online sex scandals, but his wife has kept her thoughts largely to herself until now. Huma Abedin began her career as an intern at the White House, assigned to the office of the then First Lady Hillary Clinton. Abaddon rapidly rose to become Clinton's right-hand woman for 25 years, including her two failed attempts running for president. But just like Clinton, Abaddon was marred in controversy over her husband, Anthony Weiner's cheating scandals. Today I am announcing my resignation from Congress. He publicly texted explicit images of himself to various women, at one point using the pseudonym Carlos Danger. I love him. I have forgiven him. I believe in him. And as we have said from the beginning, we are moving forward. Abaddon stuck by her husband initially, but left him after repeated similar scandals. And Weiner eventually went to prison for inappropriate online dealings with a minor. Abaddon still works for Clinton and has written a tell-all memoir called Both And. Homer Abaddon, there's a cliche that nobody thinks about their job on their deathbed, but I've never really bought into that because I think a fulfilling job is really a very incredible gift. And you have had the most astonishing job in the front row of the most amazing international events. You've met the world's most interesting people, and that must be a very rewarding thing to look back on. I've had more pinch me moments than I can count. I, I tell the story of, you know, the first time I was on the state floor and Will Smith and Jada Pinkett Smith two very popular actors um, and public figures asked me a question. My mouth dropped open. I didn't even know how to respond. Uh, but, you know, months later, how you, you, you learn that even famous people are humans. And, you know, I tried to approach everyone I met with that same, you know, kind of sense of um, respect, but also uh, their, you know, humility. And I can't think of anybody in the world who I've not had the privilege to meet. And so when I, I end the book this way, saying if I had to choose to do it all again, I would in a heartbeat. That's how incredible it was. Did the way that you observed Hillary Clinton dealing with personal crises, such as the Monica Lewinsky scandal, influence you later when you had to deal with your own personal crisis? You know, I don't believe any two situations are, you know, necessarily similar or um Comparative. I mean, I was so young when that happened. I didn't understand really, you know, never had been in a relationship. And so I was in shock. And when it was my own situation years later, in that moment, I was, there was so much trauma. There was so much devastation. And I was doing all of it in public. And so for me, I was just trying to make every, you know, decision that I thought was right for me. People forget now, but, you know, back then when the story first broke, I was not even 12 weeks pregnant with our son. And so everything changed based on, you know, the fact that I was starting a family and I was deeply in love with my husband. It was the first man I'd ever been with, my first love. Um, it was very hard. It was very hard to go through that. Through no fault of your own, the conduct of your then husband, Congressman Anthony Weiner, threw you into a huge spotlight. You write in your memoir that you asked him why, you know, why, why did you do this? Do you feel like you ever got an answer to that question? I did. And I think as, it, you know, I, as I was writing this book, first of all, yes, I preferred being invisible. I prefer being behind the scenes. But I asked why, because I didn't understand. I didn't understand the behavior. Um, and it took many years as they were researching my book. One of my colleagues came to me and said, you know, the headline that's most common about you from that time is what is wrong with her and what is she thinking? And it is why I chose to put in the book exactly what I was thinking. I take people through all the different decisions that I made, all the ways I tried to fix, you know, at least what I thought was fixing my husband or fixing our marriage or fixing our family. Do you think that there's a point at which you have to realise that you can't always understand and fix something? Yes, and I think I also found my, a new respect for, you know, I, I didn't, you know, I come from a culture where you don't talk to strangers about your problem. There is not mental health support that is actively sought out, at least when I was growing up and in my part of the world. So I believed that Anthony's behavior was something that he could, as I write in the book, just knock off, just knock it off. Why, you know, why would you waste your time? There's so much important work 
happening. I did not appreciate that it was much more complicated, that it was something that needed sustained, serious um, uh, effort on, you know, from mental health professionals, but also that you had to be committed to the work. And in the end, as I write in the book, I had to be committed and he had to be committed. And with, you know, proper therapeutic help, we were able to get to the other side, but we're going to be working on our relationship the rest of our life. And mostly because we share a child together. There was certainly uh, a conversation with people asking, what were you doing? What were you thinking? Is it fair to say, I think your memoir makes clear that it kind of boils down to one thing, which is that you really, really loved this person. Yes. To me, we fell in love by accident. One of the reasons I got so comfortable with him is because I never thought anything would ever happen. And he was doing important work. He was in you know, Congress with Hillary. And he was my first love, the first man I was ever with. I never, I write, a, you know, he was my first Valentine's date. I, I, in fact, I write in the early stages of our relationship, I thought nothing bad could ever happen to me when I was with him. You did nothing wrong yourself, and yet you had an enormous amount of shame visited upon you. How did you work your way through that? I did feel a tremendous amount of shame. I, I also feel I was shamed, you know, this notion of uh, suddenly, uh, you know, even though I had a very, very supportive family, as did he, and a very supportive group of friends, nobody really knew what to do or how to help us. And, and being judged constantly, why is she staying? She should go, she should stay. I mean, everyone had a different opinion on what I should do. And I always just try to stay focused. You're the only person who has to go to your house at night. So you have to be able to live with yourself. And I want my son to be able to read this book when he's older and, and be proud of what his mother did. Um, and frankly, even you know, be able to say, thank you for trying to help my dad. Uh, so much of this is about the next generation, how to not repeat mistakes um, in the next generation. And I'm very conscious of that, given the life and the experiences I've had. Homer, it's been lovely to talk to you. Thank you so much. Lee, thank you so much. I've so enjoyed this conversation. Hi, I'm Lee Sales. Thanks for watching this story. If you'd like to watch more of 730's stories, they are on the left of your screen. And tap on the button below to subscribe and get the latest from ABC News.